Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Life Everlasting on Death, comma, Dying, and the Future Hope. This is lesson number seven in that series for November 12 of 2022, entitled Christ's Victory Over Death. Now, the question would be, if Christ didn't rise, Paul discussed this, is there any chance of our rising? But if Christ did arise, we probably should be okay. Let's discuss that. But as usual, we like to begin with the word of prayer. Father, we have come this evening and gathered together to talk about you and to think about the ways in which we can better represent you. This is one of the most important things that has ever happened in our history of our world and the history of the great controversy, Christ's resurrection from the dead. Um, what can we learn? What new things might we be able to learn and how can we represent you the best as we study it together is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. How important to your salvation is the resurrection of Jesus? Paul clearly felt that it was Christ, if Christ was not resurrected, if he did not come back to life, then there is no hope for any of us beyond the grave. Do you think that's correct? Yes. In a word, yes. Yeah, very, very complicated answer there. Okay. Paul felt very strongly that he needed to preach to the Corinthians nothing except the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, but the story must not end there. He also rose from the dead. And this is where what makes the story so remarkable. I mean, obviously, many, many thousands and thousands of people were crucified, and there probably were some good people who were crucified. But what makes this story different is, of course, who it was is really important. But if he had stayed dead, the issue would have been, what next? So, of course, the huge thing about this story is he didn't stay dead. However, would it be necessary to have a resurrection if, in fact, the dead somehow go to heaven or to hell at the time of death? No, that wouldn't <laughs> be necessary, so. We're, we're, you know, we're getting it, big, it, long answers here in the questions, that way. Yeah, well, it's true. straightforward. <laughs> yeah, pretty straightforward. Well, from our Bible study guide, we read, Jim? Christ's mission seemed to have ended, that is, even failed, with his death on the cross. Satan succeeded in instigating Judas to betray the Savior, and the chief priests and elders to demand his death. After Jesus was arrested, all the disciples forsook him and fled. And Peter denied him three times. Now Jesus was lying in a tomb hewed out of a rock, closed with a large it's going to be large and sealed stone, protected by Roman guards and watched by invisible demonic powers. If he could, he, that is Satan, would have held Christ locked in the tomb. Ellen White from Manuscript Releases, Volume 12. And I will repeat again the thing, the mantra that I have suggested. When Jesus was born on this earth, Christ was determined, I mean, when Satan was determined to do one of three things. One, first of all, get him to sin. He said, no human being has lived on this earth without sinning. We are going to get this guy to sin. He failed. As it came down t closer to the end of his life and he hadn't failed, Satan said, well, let's make, his, let's make life so difficult for him that he'll just say, well, he doesn't have to sin, but he just has to give up and go back to heaven. Is that what the crucifixion and pre-crucifixion torture was all about? Well, partially, yes, exactly. And then finally he said, okay, now he's dead. We have to keep him in the grave. And he failed with that too. So all three of these efforts by Satan were failures. Well, and he also had a precursor, a, a lesson about that with Lazarus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if he, had kept, if he could have kept Jesus in the grave, that really wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. All of these events should not have been such a surprise to the disciples because Jesus had told them repeatedly that he would be handed over to the Gentiles and that he would be put to death, but that he would rise again on the third day. And 
I, I'm going to just take a moment and read Luke 18, because this is so outstanding. On the way up from Jerusalem, I'm, I'm sorry, way up from Jericho to Jerusalem, on their way to the last Passover, that one when Jesus, of course, was finally crucified, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come, to, will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will rock, mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise to life. Now, question for you all. Is there any, any words or any expressions in that that should be difficult to understand? No, but if their thinking was, and they had been taught forever that he was going to be the king, and yep. you know. But the goes on, going on to verse 34, but the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. So what was the problem? Their paradigm was wrong. Okay. And, and couldn't accept something that went against what they thought they knew was true. They, they, they couldn't hear it. They fully believed that they were, um, give me a moment. But as we will see, all the efforts carried out by his enemies, the Jewish leaders only provided additional evidence that Jesus actually did arise from the dead and did return to heaven. All the security measures taken to keep Jesus locked in the tomb only made his victory over death more widely known. And of course, we should just say that Jesus and his disciples were traveling with a large group of other people on their way up to Passover, and that entire group was certain that they were escorting Jesus up to Jerusalem to crown him king. So there was no question in their minds that's what was gonna happen. So now try to imagine yourself as one of the Jewish leaders on Resurrection Day. What did they feel, what did they tell people who asked them? Where is Jesus? Of course, their explanation would be that, well, his disciples stole the body away while the soldiers slept. What's wrong with that argument? Soldiers would be executed for such a crime. Exactly. But there were much mightier forces trying to prevent Jesus arising from the tomb. Uh, Carrie? From the writings of Ellen G. White, when Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb. Seeking to hold Christ a prisoner, he was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. That's from the okay, Zion. Gordon, why don't you take the Bible study guide there? In the Bible study guide for Monday. And though Jesus and though Christ's humanity died, his divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Matthew 28, John 10, and Romans 8 give us some apparently contradictory information about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had told his disciples that he had the power to lay down his life and take it back again. He told Martha that he was the resurrection and the life. Other passages, such as Acts 2, Romans 8, and Galatians 1, Hebrews 13, suggest that he was, he was raised by God the Father. As we know, a mighty angel was involved when he came down and rolled the stone back and called for Jesus to come forth. In some places, it says that the Spirit was responsible. So who did it? Myra? I don't think it matters, but um, from Ellen G. White, she says, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now it was proved the, word, proved the truth of his words, I lay down my life, that I may take it up again, that I might take it up again. I have the power to lie it, lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. Now it was fulfilled, the prophecy he had spoken, 
to the priests and to the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again, John 10, 17 and chapter 18 verses. No, no. John 10, 17 and 17 18 in chapter 18 two. And two. Chapter two, verse 19. Over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. And of course, that was the argument that Satan had been fighting about all the time from the beginning of the, the rebellion in heaven, that he should be equal to Christ, he should take Christ's place, and now what does he find out? No possibility. All created beings, including Lucifer, live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God from the highest seraph to the humblest animate being. Are all are rep replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. Desire of Ages 785 from Ellen White. So the universe and the angels had never come to that conclusion until this point well that that he truly was god well the, okay if we take the words of ellen white she says that before satan was thrown out of heaven god called a council and he said let me explain to you even though jesus moves among angels as an angel the Michael of the Archangels, he is equal with me. He is divine. He is not like Satan. He's not, li or not like Lucifer. Lucifer is an angel. He's a created being. Uh, my son, Jesus Christ, is divine. He re made that very clear to them. But Satan, of course, didn't agree with that. Okay. Do we have any texts that come close to saying what Mrs. White says? for those that don't want to take I mean, anything. at what point in time, there's a lots of texts in the Bible that say that he was divine. True. Uh, and you're asking, are well, there any? before, in heaven, when Satan was. Well, of course, the, the obvious one would be Revelation 12, where it's Michael the Archangel versus Lucifer, and Michael the Archangel, my, the word Michael means uh, the one, one who is like God or, who is like God or the one who is like God. And there's many other, other places in scripture, if we had time, we could go and show that yeah. that's clearly, he's divine, yeah. So are these reports of the source of Jesus' resurrection actually contradictory? So, as Myra asked, does it make a difference whether God the Father did it or Jesus did it in himself or the Holy Spirit did it? Well, yes, it does make a difference. It makes a difference because the challenge from Lucifer was, I should be equal with Jesus Christ. He never claimed to be equal with the Father. He never claimed to be equal with the Holy Spirit. He only, his contest was with Christ and partly because Christ had moved among the angels as Michael the Archangel. So he, Lucifer tried to say, well, he shouldn't be treated any different than I treated. So this was important because Christ said, okay, let me show you why I am different. Boom, I can rise from, my, from the dead. Lucifer, don't ever try that. Well, someday you can try it, but it won't work. So that's... So that. There was nothing that we have recorded that they had any indication before the death of Christ. An indication of what? That he was God, other than him saying, I am one with the Father. That Jesus was, you mean? Yes. Well... He said, that's, he that's, said several times, I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that, that means I am God. Yeah. yeah. And they understood what he said because they, they, they took stones to, to, to kill well, him. I'm, I'm thinking of those two thirds of the angels and the, the third, you know. Mm -hmm. They're looking on and going w during that period of time, not so much when he was on earth, mm -hmm. but we don't Back have. Back in heaven. Yeah. Well, and also you had the, the Gerge seeds. Remember the, the, the demons uh -huh. there at, at, across from Gal and Galilee, they recognized that he was who he was. Yeah. yeah. And this is some time before the, mm -hmm. yeah. so. Okay, well. Nothing, nothing like being persistent in your <laughs> paradigm, that's, that's right? That's good, yeah. <laughs> okay, Jim, I think you have Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Yeah, 11 to 15. While the women 
went over, excuse me, went on their way, some of the soldiers guarding the tomb went back to the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. The chief priests met with the elders and made their plan. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say that his, this, excuse me, that his disciples came during the night and stole his body while you were asleep. And if the governor should hear of this, we will convince him that you are innocent and you will have nothing to worry about. The guards took the money and did what they were told to do. And so that is the report spread round by the Jews to this very day, American Bible Society, yeah. Good News okay. Bible. At the time of Christ, so at the time of Christ's resurrection, the Roman guard fell like dead men. They were obviously eyewitnesses of what had happened. The story that they were given by the priests is self-contradictory. We've already mentioned that. If they were sleeping, how could they have known that the disciples came and stole their body and took it away? And I mean, the huge gargantuan stone, you think you could have r rolled that stone back without waking anybody up? I mean. Did those Roman soldiers tell the truth to anyone other than the priests and Pilate? And here's what I want you to ask me, answer me. When they went home to Rome, did they tell the truth to their families? Bet some did. Yeah, they must have. It had been the most amazing thing that had ever happened to them. What did they discuss in the barracks that night? I'm sure they discussed this thing in detail. You know, what did you say? How quick did you wake up? Did you see this? Did you see that? Did you? The priests obviously heard something that disturbed them enormously. Why would they give a large sum of money to the soldiers to keep them quiet? It had to be the truth about the resurrection of Jesus. Not to take anything away from the importance of the main event, however, there were other things that happened in connection with the resurrection of Jesus. One, a massive earthquake shook the area. Two, those whose graves had been thrown open at his death arose and went into Jerusalem where many people saw them and where they witnessed to the resurrection. Man, I wish we had information about what they said and exactly even who it was that was speaking. So was there a major uh, earthquake at the time of the, of the death and another one at the time of the resurrection? Yes, that is correct. That is correct. It was a shaky affair. <laughs> Earth-shaking affair, let's put it that way. We do not know exactly what the appearance of these people was when they went into the city, but we do know that they were raised to eternal life and ascended with Jesus to heaven. Now, I, when it says they ascended with Jesus to heaven, does that mean 40 days later when he ascended officially from the disciples from, from the Mount of Olives? Or did they ascend to Jesus that day when he went up to heaven to see his father? Well, they wouldn't have had a whole lot of time to be witnesses if they went at the same yeah. time that Jesus went. It's not clear from the, the day of the yeah, resurrection. I, I agree with you. I, it's just not clear in the scriptures. Was it obvious to the people to whom they spoke that they had risen from the dead? Well, you just wonder who, who those people were and yeah. if, if they were ancestors or not that long ago. Was that Job? Was it yeah. Abraham? Was it, yeah. uh, you know. And were, only, were they only people who were buried right around Jerusalem? That would be. For those people what, to know. Was Adam one of the people raised? Well. Was this giant going into uh, yeah. Jerusalem? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you had heard the story of one of those resurrected beings, how would it impact you? What did they say? What, what would you say under those circumstances? I mean, they didn't know about the story of Jesus. How would they prove who they were? And, and would they say, you know, what happened to Jerusalem? This doesn't look like the Jerusalem that I knew. I mean, what would they say? Well, later, not all the priests were completely unbelieving, even though they seemed to be so obstinate at this point in time. Um, Gordon, I believe that's yours, X6. X6, seven. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples <clears throat> in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, that is Sadducees, accepted the faith, Good News Bible. Okay, so a great number of priests became Christian, believers in Jesus. 
think of the situation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. From a human standpoint, they controlled the Jewish nation. They were able to convince Pilate and the Roman soldiers to give a false report of what happened. But even the story they gave to the soldiers was contradictory. We've already talked about that. The testimony of those who had been raised from the dead proved them wrong. Ten distinct resurrection appearances of Christ prior to his ascension can be documented in Scripture. And you know what I realized? This is, this is something I, I got these ideas from other different sources and I tried to put them together chronologically. Number one, ought, really ought to be the appearance to the soldiers. They were the first ones to see him come forth from the grave. So we need to add number one to this story. I hadn't even thought about that until we just talked about it a few moments ago. But then, number one listed in our handout was uh, that was Myra? Yes. Appearance number one to Mary Magdalene near the tomb, as recorded in John and Mark and John again, say that Mary did not initially see Jesus, but saw the empty tomb and ran to tell Peter and John. Soon after that, Jesus appeared to Mary. Okay, John. so let's be clear here. She saw the empty tomb, she ran to tell the disciples, then later she came back with following Peter and John, so, but she was apparently the first of the disciples. To, so go ahead. For the followers. Okay. Yeah. For, Mark 16, 9 to 11 says, After Jesus rose from death early on Sunday, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. She went and told his companions. They were, were mourning and crying. And when they heard her say that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe her. Who would believe a woman? Yeah, yeah who would that's... believe a woman, and how could this be? Of yeah. course I would believe a woman. The woman had not all come, reading from Ellen White, had not all come from, to the tomb from the same direction. Mary Magdalene was the first to reach the place, and that's why when she saw the empty tomb, she could run to tell the disciples before the other woman even arrived there. Um, and upon seeing that the stone was removed, she hurried away to tell the disciples, Desire of Ages 788. Mary had not heard the good news. She went to Peter and John with the sorrowful message. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. John 20, verses 1 and 2, Desire of Ages. And then, Jim, you want to take on there? Um, Ellen White says, Mary had followed John and Peter to the tomb. When they returned to Jerusalem, she remained. Another voice addressed her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Through her tear-dimmed eyes, Mary saw the form of a man, and thinking that it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if thou have borne him oh, hence, tell him where you, excuse me, tell me where you, where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. John 12, 20, verse 15. And we don't have time to go into all the details, but she had an empty grave well, that she owned. She would be happy to take his body there, right? Go ahead. But now, in his familiar voice, Jesus said to her, Mary, now she knew that, that it was not a stranger who was addressing her and turning, she saw before her the living Christ. In her joy, she forgot that he had been crucified. Springing toward him as if to embrace his feet, she said, Rabboni. But Christ raised his hand, saying, Detain me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I, ascended, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And Mary went her way to the disciples with the joyful message. This is so the this is, pages, page yeah. 790. So this is now her second time to go to the disciples. First of all, she went with the news that the tomb was empty. And now she's going back with the message. I've seen him. I've seen him. I've talked to him. Yes. So, okay. Carrie, you want to take, oh, yes, go ahead. I, I'm just curious why we think that he appeared to Mary first. That has been discussed a lot. And I. I mean, am, it's supposition from yeah. anybody, but. Well. I think that Dr. Graham Maxwell had the best idea, and that's it. He appeared to her first because she was there. Yeah, okay. Because she cared enough to be there? She was, she there. was there. 
And the, I mean, the other side of that, of course, is that if any of the Roman group came there and they saw any of the disciples, the men, they would have started to accuse them of all kinds of things. But a woman, ah, oh, she's just a woman. She's got, you know, so it was easier for her to be there. So, but yeah, she was there. That's what matters. Okay, you want to talk about number two, Carrie? Yes. And it's to do with the women returning from the tomb. Then we go Matthew 28, 8 to 10. So they, the other women, left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Now this, they're, they're, they're still going to tell the disciples, okay, uh, the tomb is empty, but we saw an angel. Okay, that's what they've seen. Go ahead. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Meanwhile, the other women came up. A light was shining about the tomb, but the body of Jesus was not there. As they lingered about the place, suddenly they saw they were not alone. A young man clothed in shining garments was sitting by the tomb. It was the angel who had rolled away the stone. He had taken the guise of humanity that he might not alarm these friends of Jesus. Yet about him the light of heavenly glory was still shining, and the women were afraid. They turned to flee, but the angel's words stayed their steps. Fear not ye, he said, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Now, it's hard to know for sure how you that's put... That's from Desire of Ages. Yeah, that's from Desire of Ages. It's a little difficult. I think this paragraph actually goes before that last one. I think when the Jesus appearance to them was probably on their way to tell, it seems that it was on their way to tell the disciples. So the appearance to the, an, of the angel to them must have been first. And then, so technically, this paragraph, although it wasn't an appearance of Jesus per se, it probably should have been before the other one. Okay. Appearance number three was to Peter. Ellen White says from Desire of Ages, the disciples, that is Peter and John, hurried to the tomb and found it as Mary had said. They saw the shroud and the napkin, but they did not find their Lord. Yet even here was testimony that he had risen. The grave clothes were not thrown heedlessly aside, but carefully folded, each in a place by itself. John saw and believed. He did not yet understand the scripture that Christ must rise from the dead, but he now remembered the Savior's words for telling his resurrection. So he's starting to put things together. Yeah, he's starting to put things together, okay. From Ellen G. White again, Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. In John it says, he ascended to the heavenly courts and from God himself heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of man, of, of men, had been ample and through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant between, uh, the covenant made with Christ and he would receive re repentant and obedient men and would love them even as he loves th his son. Christ was to complete his work and fulfill his pledge to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man with a golden wedge of Ophir. Mm -hmm. That's from Isaiah 13, 12. All power in heaven and earth was given to the Prince of Life, and he returned to his followers in a world of sin that he might impart to them his power and glory. That's from Desire of Ages 7. Oh, okay, and the next statement from Ellen White, when Christ came to this world, he found that Satan had everything as he wanted it. The adversary of God and man thought that he was indeed the prince of the earth, but Jesus laid hold of the world to take it out of the power of Satan. He came to redeem it from the curse of sin and the penalty of transgression. 
that the transgressor might be forgiven. He planted the cross between earth and heaven and between divinity and humanity. And as the Father beheld the cross, he was satisfied. He said, it is enough. The offering is complete. God and man may be reconciled. And of course, that's, that's the golden goal, isn't it? Those who have lived in rebellion against God may become reconciled if, as they see the cross, they become repentant and accept the great propitiation that Christ has made for their sins. In the cross, they see that mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have t kissed each other from signs of times from 1889 and other places. Jim? While the Savior was in God's presence, receiving for his church, the disciples thought upon the empty tomb and mourned and wept. The day that was a day of rejoicing to all heaven was the to the disciples a day of uncertainty, confusion, and perplexity. Their unbelief in the testimony of the woman gives evidence of how low their faith had sunk. The news of Christ's resurrection was so different from what they had anticipated that they could not believe it. It was too good to be true, they thought. They had heard so much of the doctrine and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees that the impression made on their minds in regard to the resurrection was vague. Let me interrupt there for just a second. What was the teaching of the Sadducees? This life is all there is. There is no resurrection. There is no resurrection, nothing beyond this life, okay? They scarcely knew that the resurrection from the dead could mean they were unable to take a great, take in the, take great. In the great subject. This is our page is 790. That's amazing, isn't it? Okay, Carrie, number four. One of the most incredible stories connected with Resurrection Sunday is the story of the two men traveling to Emmaus as recorded by Luke. And we're going we're gonna to skip reading this entire story. I hope it's very familiar to you. I'll review it very briefly. These two men were leaving in the evening. They're on their way to Emmaus, which is seven or eight miles away. And on the way, Jesus appeared to them. He didn't allow them to understand who he was, but he started to explain to them. And they said to him, you know, he says, what are you talking about? And they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened there today? And so Jesus quietly starts to explain, well, you know what it says in the Old Testament, da, 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 and he goes through this thing. And, and they, they end up later saying, man, our hearts burned within us as he explained all that stuff. And then when they finally got to their house and Emmaus, he, they convinced him to stay with them um, and to offer a, a, a word of prayer over the meal. And when he raised his hands, they saw the scars in his hands and they said, it's the Lord. And Jesus disappeared. I have a question. Yes. So Jesus went through point by point from the scriptures, the Old Testament, of the things that pointed to him and what fulfilled him. Why don't we have those texts reported here? Yeah, I'm convinced that when they came back and explained the boom, 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 the things you just asked about, that was, those are the main points that the disciples used from that point on to explain the life and, and experience of Jesus Christ, I'm sure. Do um, so you think that's what's in the rest of the Bible? Yeah, I think that's probably the story that was based on, it was the basis of Stephen's speech in Acts 6, Acts 7, I guess, actually, um, and other Paul's, Paul's speeches, Paul's yeah. Paul's speeches. But I do, I wish we had the, from Jesus, boom, 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 that would be so nice. It's, 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 it would be making it too simple. Yeah. Too obvious, maybe, huh? So anyway, so then of course they turned around, even though it was dark, they stumbled all the way back to Jerusalem. Jesus followed them. Then they knocked on the door and identified themselves by their voices and they were, they were, the door was locked. They were allowed into the upper room and of course with them, Jesus um, went with them and they started explaining everything and then suddenly Jesus appeared and explained everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So they probably had the same points repeated to them in the upper room. Yeah. If 
I were to guess. Okay, appearance number five. Appearance number five was to the ten apostles, as in Luke, what you just implied, Luke yeah. 24, 36, but Thomas was not there. Thomas was absent. Okay, and then you want to go ahead and do number six as well? Number six was to the eleven apostles, including Thomas, and what recorded was, in John 20, 26 okay, to 31. Okay, what was different about that appearance? In, well... It happened a week later, and this yeah. time Thomas was with them. Thomas was there and touched him. Yeah. And 1 Corinthians 15, 5, then he appeared to Peter and to all the 12 apostles. Okay. And then appearance number seven. You want to do seven and eight, Myra? Okay. To the uh, seven disciples beside the Sea of Galilee is recorded in John 21. We're going to talk more about some of these things down a little, but we're just reviewing the, all of them right now. And appearance number eight was to the more than 500 people, possibly, possibly on an appointed mountain in Galilee. An appointed mountain? Well, that means a, he, had, he, he didn't, we, they didn't give, he didn't give us that information, but he told them, I will meet you at such and such a yeah. place. And so this, that's what it means by appointed mountain. I, I just hadn't heard that. Uh, that's from Matthew 28. And then appearance nine to James, the half-brother of Jesus. We have no information about that at all except Paul's statement saying, yes, he did appear to James, his half-brother. And then appearance number 12, to the apostles number at 10. the ascension. Hmm? Number, number 10. 10. Number 10, I'm sorry. The apostles at the ascension, of course, that was the report we know that he, he met them in Jerusalem, he, and he spent some time with them, and then he led them out of Jerusalem, down across the valley, up to the top of Mount Olives, over the other side a little ways to probably near the site of Bethany. Uh, and then, of course, he rose. And that was the last, that he, last physical appearance he made, except in vision to whom? Oh. Paul. That would appear in number 11. But now we think that all of these things probably should be, we should go back and put number one as his appearance to the, to the, to the um, Roman soldiers. But then we have this statement. Jesus appeared many times after his resurrection. Acts 1 verse 3 said, now I don't know, all these, is this 11 times that we've talked about, is that many? Jesus appeared many times after his resurrection. Now, all except the last couple of, the, last three or four of these, um, all happened on the first day. But, Acts 1 through verse, verse 3 says, For 40 days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. So that sounds to me like there are a lot of other appearances that he didn't mention. Um, of course, the one in Galilee would have been a while later, somewhere among those 40 days. And the, the, the one by the, the seven by the lake would have been one of those appearances. Well, our Bible study guide goes on to explain something more, Jim. During the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Uh, let's see, jo Jesus joined some disciples at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast with them, followed by a talk with Peter there might have been other appearances of Jesus before the final one at his ascension. Paul also considered himself an eyewitness to the risen Christ who appeared to him on the road to Damascus. From the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, this October, November Okay. 9th. I can't imagine the disciples leaving him. He must have just disappeared after he had explained something because I, Mm -hmm. They would have hung on to him. Yeah. So here's the real question. Why didn't Jesus make a grand entrance into the temple in all his glory? This was Passover weekend. There were millions of, probably two million people in Jerusalem. So all in Jerusalem for the Passover, and thus the world would know that he was risen. Why not? I want to know, too. <laughs> you want to know, too. Nobody's going to speculate for me. It would have raised a, probably raised a lot of questions. Would, what? Yeah. It would have terrified the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It would have been a, it would have been a, a mob of people there, right? And probably. And people go mad rapidly in crowds and return, yeah. to, return to their senses slowly, one by one. 
Yeah. How has the life of death of Jesus impacted your life, my life? Can your family, your friends, and your associates tell that you have been impacted? How has the life of Christ affected all of us in amazing ways? And I'm just asking you to think about this. Um, when Jesus met seven of his disciples on the shore of Lake Galilee, after they had been fishing all night without any success, he gave them evidence that he would still be with them. Jesus still had some further things to say, especially to Peter, and we know about that story. And finally the day came when he needed to say goodbye to them. Gary? Then he led them out of the city as far as Bethany, where he raised his hands and blessed them. As he was blessing them, he departed from them and was taken up into heaven. They worshipped him and went back into Jerusalem, filled with great joy, and spent all their time in the temple giving thanks to God. Okay, there's part of the answer to the question I just raised. Jesus didn't appear in the temple, but the disciples spent their time in the temple telling anybody who would listen, look, we have seen him, repeatedly we have seen him, he's alive, he rose from the dead. And this may be the time when those people who raised from, the, from death with him were witnessing also. Yes, Not possibly. just the disciples, but yep. those raised. But Jesus was not finished appearing to his followers. Think of the story of Paul. And when do you think that happened? George 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal. Good news Bible. And here's a question for you. We know from re re carefully reviewing Paul's story that as a young man, he was in Jerusalem getting his education under Gamaliel. Was he in Jerusalem at the same time Jesus was? And if so, is it really true that he never ever saw him? Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. Okay, Thomas had not been present, and we, going back just to fill in more details of what we covered. Thomas had not been present on the night that Jesus first appeared to the other ten disciples. One week later, he was with them when Jesus appeared to them again. Jesus said something important to Thomas, and that's why we're going to discuss it here. Yeah, from John 20, 29. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's from the King, New King James Version. Why is that important to us? We haven't seen him. We didn't get to see it. We only have the reports of other people. And all those in Asia and Europe and every, most of the people of the world didn't get a chance to see him. No. So what kind of evidence do we still have that Jesus was real and that his resurrection was important? That would be mine. Here is a man, and you can look this up on the internet if you choose to do that. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, three and a half years actually, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. This was written a uh, number of years, a hundred years ago. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone, and totally today he is the centerpiece of the human race and leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, 
all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. That was in a sermon by Dr. James Allen Francis about nine, early 1900s. God of, so, yes. So Jesus went to Egypt. He was taken to Egypt. He was as taken a child. to Egypt. Is that less than 200 miles? Yeah, it's less than 200 miles. <laughs> I thought it was more. Well, it's probably close, but it's, it, you know, it's, you could, an ordinary person was supposed to be able to walk it in like 10, 12 days. Okay. That's a. Okay. If you take, of course it would depend, I guess if you, you had, take the shortest route, yeah. Um, God, of course, knew what he had in mind regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even way back in the days of Moses. How do we know that? While Jesus rose in his heavenly body, he will always retain the marks in his hands and his feet as trophies of his success in the great controversy. But when we are raised from the dead, all traces of sin, disease, injury will be gone. And there's a number of references from Ellen White implying that, but that's implied by the Bible as well. Christ will ever identify himself with humanity, with human beings, having given up the um, his omnipotence, he will forever retain a human form. Jim? Modern sentiments don't, excuse me, modern sentiment doesn't allow for something like the resurrection of Jesus. However, the historical evidence is so strong that even those who can't accept the reality of the resurrection are forced to admit that many people believed that they had seen the resurrection of Jesus. So they, they, they can't prove that he was resurrected, but they, there's plenty of evidence that a lot of people believe that, okay? Thus, much of their, the anti-resurrection apologetics is the attempt to explain what could have caused all these different people to believe that they had seen the risen Christ. Some have argued that the disciples hallucinated the resurrection, the resurrected Jesus. Others, that Jesus hadn't really died but had only had swooned and was then and and then come back to life after he had been brought down from the cross and when he had a, reappeared his followers thought that he had been raised from the dead and that is believe or it or not some have argued that jesus had a twin brother with, Can you believe this? with whom the disciples mistook the risen christ in other words the historical evidence is so strong for christ's resurrection that these are the kinds of arguments people can cock in order to try to dismiss it with the resurrection itself so important we should not be surprised by all the good reasons we have been given to believe it from the bible study guide for november 11. So now I would like to pick one of those things and expand on it a little bit. Would you, if you're one of the disciples, been willing to die for a belief which was just made up and which you knew was not true? That would be pretty foolish, wouldn't it? Okay. If you knowingly would die for what you knew was false. Uh, yeah. A, a fabrication. So they, they believed it. Yeah. Disciples believe. Okay, Ellen White comments. Carrie? The voice that cried from the cross, it is finished, was heard amongst the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were open, but at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him above all principalities, above, uh, above rather, all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. That's from... Elton. Think of the plight of the religious leaders who begged Pilate to give them a guard to keep the grave shut so his disciples could not steal his body. <laughs> I have to chuckle. I, I'm sorry. They ended up 
paying large sums of money to those same guards to say that his disciples did steal his body. <laughs> what does that reveal to us about the truth? Wow. From the Bible study guide, the cross is Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil, and his resurrection is a culminating triumphal event. Death could not retain Jesus, for he had never committed sin and was sinless in all his actions. Jesus' death is the central point of his accomplishments. However, the cross without the resurrection would become only a beautiful philosophy of unselfish service and have no salvific significance. It's an interesting point. So, yeah. you know, it would be a, a nice philosophy if Jesus lived this wonderful life and died. Mm. But resurrecting, raising from the dead is the, is the crucial thing. Furthermore, the cross without the resurrection would be would, would be a demonstration of sacrificial love, but have no more power to transform lives and bring a decisive solution to the problem of sin and death. It would be incapable of providing eternal life for believers. From the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page okay. 93. Jesus has given us two major symbols to celebrate his death and resurrection. One, baptism, and two, the Lord's Supper. We don't have the time to discuss those today, but... Um, those are the symbols that he has given us specifically to, to represent that. The best explanation of the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is laid out in 1 Corinthians 15, in which the Apostle Paul explains why the resurrection of Jesus is so important. First, Paul provides the historical reason and argues that there are many witnesses of Christ's resurrection. If their testimony is dismissed, then all who testified that they had an encounter with Christ would be false witnesses. Christ appeared to Peter, to the apostles, to James, the 500, and to Paul himself in 1 Corinthians. Then Paul engages in a theological reasoning in defense of the resurrection and offers several crucial points. One, if there was no resurrection of the dead, then even Jesus Christ was not resurrected. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is in vain. Greek objective, kinos. Adjective. I'm sorry, what? The Greek ag adjective. <laughs> adjective, kinos. Am I, am I saying that right? Yeah, kinos, kinos actually. Kinos also means useless or empty. Our faith loses its content and the power if Jesus is still dead. So the implication there is that the, the Greek word implies that if Jesus is not resurrected, all that we, all that we believe in is just empty. It, it has no meaning whatsoever. Number four, if Christ is not raised, then the dead will not be raised. There will be no hope after death. If Christ has been not been raised, we are false witnesses about God because we testify about God's raising Christ. So if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then the picture of God and his character is distorted and we are misrepresenting him. However, the Father truthfully raised Christ from the dead. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. The meaning of the Greek ad adjective Matthias. Matthias is worthless. Our faith in God would have no relevance in our lives. Number seven, if Christ had not been raised, there would be no forgiveness of our trespasses, and we remain in our sins. As sinners, we deserve only the death sentence. If Christ, number eight, if Christ had not been raised, then there is no resurrection of the dead in Christ and thus no eternal life. Number nine, if Christ had not been raised, has not been raised, and if only this life we could hope in Christ, then we are all people to be most pitied. Paul uses the Greek adjective, and again, Eleanos, Eleanos which means miserable, Thus, we have only a nice spiritual teaching about Jesus that pertains only to the earthly, this earthly life. We are most miserable. 
according to Paul, because Jesus was crucified and died, so death inevitably will be the final fate of all. Number 10. If the dead are not, be, are not to be raised, then we should eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Our motto in life should be carpe diem, in order that at least the least experience at least experience a little bit of happiness and Carpe diem means grab whatever you can for today. Yes. Of course, none of these things are true because Christ is raised. The resurrection is a fact, and we can claim it as our everlasting joy. Do you feel like living a Christian life today is pitiful? I, I have some problems with thought Paul's argument there, although, I mean, think of all he went through, and it was, and he was, he, you know, well, Within a, within a hair's breadth of his death so many times and so forth. But Paul compared the death and resurrection to an agricultural event. The seed must be cast into the soil and do, it die before it can rise to new life. At the second coming of Christ, those who sleep in the dust will be resurrected. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Death is swallowed up in victory. Um, sorry. Uh, then Paul writes about the glorious and triumphant shout of victory. The word victory is used three times in this last chapter section. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Praise the Lord because this victory over death is given to the faithful in Christ. How grateful we should be. Now that we have reviewed Gethsemane, the cross, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection, which is most important to you? Which was the center of all Christ's activities? Now let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. So many people, so many Christians believe Christ came to die and pay the, de the debt for my, for my sins. But then we have suggested in this lesson that if he hadn't, raised, if he hadn't risen from the dead, the death wouldn't, have, wouldn't be anything more than a lot of other people who were crucified. So, what do you think is most important? It's right. All of it. All of it. Yeah, it's a, it's life, a package. Life, death, and resurrection. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We have to have Paul, the whole... Paul says we are healed by his life. Mm -hmm. Yep. Romans 5.10. Yeah. So, we're asking you to think about those issues. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what an incredible lesson this is and what incredible challenges for our thinking as we review the incredible uh, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and all that it should imply for us as Christians. We thank you for all that you did and we're so excited to know that you rose from the dead so it's possible that one day we might rise to be with you forever. May that be true and may it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.